that's the challenge with these companies is that, that, that people can have great ideas and they can't go anywhere with them and they get extremely frustrated. Mm. Now that's where fortunately Founders Factory exists, yep. of course. Um, yeah. So Founders Factory that we've just yeah. set up has been based on some of those learnings of my own experience of running a large corporation, then my experience of sitting on those boards as you've said, and seeing how hard it is to do innovation in those companies, and not because management are foolish or stupid, mm. um, but because their structures are not set up to do that. They're not set up to disrupt mm. themselves, and they're not set up to reward innovation in that way, and they're not set up necessarily to attract the right sort of talent. Yeah. So Founders Factory is an arm's length company that, is, that will be backed by six corporates, um, one per vertical, and will incubate companies and accelerate others for them meaning that at the end of five years, we should have stakes in over 200 companies which we've either accelerated or incubated. Right. And um, we think that'll be a great way for corporates to be in touch with innovation and for us to move the strategic needle for them. Mm. Um, and also, they'll be seconding people to us. They'll be having their young, bright sparks with ideas. We'll be feeding those in, 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 into this company. Yeah. Um, and we think this company will be a hive, a talent magnet, basically. Yeah. So is, talk about Founders Factory. So is Explain to me how, how it works. Because I go onto the website, and basically, if, if I see myself as an entrepreneur and I want to pitch myself uh, to be in this amazing Brenner Hoberman or sort of Founders Factory yeah. environment, um, then I can pitch. Uh, alternatively, if it's also, it seems like you're doing your own businesses and launching yeah. those. And then there's also a third tier, which is obviously, you know, the Guardian Media Group comes to you and says, we want to be in line, you know, in touch with the new things that are coming about. So do they, are those three strands, or is it all, Businesses a, that it all sort of works together, but basically okay. we work with the corporates in each sector and yeah. say, look, here the, here's what we've seen. We'll do a call out and say, right, for media companies, for example, the guy will say, anyone who's got brilliant ideas for media, small teams who want us to accelerate them, that means six months and we'll yeah. be helping them. Um, come to us. We'll sit with the Guardian teams, and we just did this last week, mm. uh, and it was a really useful process, um, getting the input from the Guardian teams about um, some of the companies th that we're going to be taking in. Yeah. And so that already means you're helping find product market fit very early on in the process. Right. And you've most likely, it's not guaranteed, but most likely to have a very big customer for those companies early on as well, and you're bringing credibility to those startups as well. Yeah, yeah. So the other angle is the the bit that's even harder probably is this ideation, for want of a better term, of how you incubate, what other models, the business models you're going to incubate, and working with, with, with the companies on that. And then the really hardest bit is finding who's going to run those companies, which you've right. alluded to, who's going to be the founder of that company that's not necessarily their idea. Right. Um, we're not the first people to have conquered this. So I, it's, yeah. We mustn't think it's impossible to do that. I have lots of friends of mine who launch like one new business a year. It's their idea. They incubate it and they find brilliant MBAs or whatever to run it and yeah. they give them a decent stake of it. So it can be done, but I think the greatest risk is finding that person, which is why we're very focused on keeping up with young talent and young founders. Yeah, absolutely right. And that's why Founders Forum can then lead into the Founders fa very and, and, it's, and, it, and Founders of the Future. And, right. all yeah, yeah. Pieces. and we have a recruitment business, Founders Keepers as well. Okay. And we have a consultancy business, Founders Intelligence, right. that also works with large corporates and they pay us to understand how startups are going to disrupt them and to do digital transformation for them. Yeah. So we get, um, there a lot of ways of launching our web, casting our web very wide mm. um, to understand what's going on globally in these industries. Yeah. So you've basically wrapped up business. That's fantastic. It's a good Just the digital <laughs> bit. <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice bit to be in, isn't it? Not the sort of the unsexy stuff. Yeah. Um, because the Guardian Media Group uh, quoted uh, in the Guardian uh, their own CEO, David Pemsel, um, talking about his investment into Founders yeah. uh, Factory, he said this strategic investment gives GMG the opportunity to bring emerging technology trends into our own business and culture, giving us access to global network of startups and the chance to get in early with possible commercial opportunities. So, I mean, this guy is obviously raving about it. The, the one per industry, is that obviously so is you don't get competition and sort of the... Yeah, initially, kind of actually, when, when we first thought of the idea, we actually thought we might have multiples per sector. And then we're actually very grateful that the first Macmillan who came in first and then The Guardian both said to us, we want the whole sector on our own. Um, it's simpler to manage for us, uh, and, yeah. uh, and 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 for the for the entrepreneurs, we think it actually gives a clear a, a clearer path and a clearer way of working. So, yeah. I think it's better. We now expect to have 
mostly one per sector. The next two sectors we should be announcing yeah. over the next few weeks, we think we'll be, we, we know, we'll, are taking yeah. the whole sector themselves. Okay, it'll be interesting to see what happens when News Corp offer you three times what Guardian Media Group are paying you. <laughs> <laughs> they're, lo they're locked out now, they're locked out. Right, you snooze, okay. you lose. So you better get the, in the there Guardian quick. acted <laughs> very fast, they, they, they move very quickly. Yeah. Um, and, and saw the strategic fit um, yeah. very well. Yeah, that's why you've been on their board, I guess. They've taken some of the DNA <laughs> from you. Um, but talking about innovation, so for example, let's just say you're one of those poor companies that are not Guardian Media Group in that yeah. space. Hey, give up now. Give up, go <laughs> home, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, because yeah. you were told back at lastminute.com after the 9-11 crash, I think you were told yeah. that you guys should just go home. Give the money back. Give our the chairman money back. sat Martha and I in a room downstairs in our basement, I remember it, and said, you've got about 50 million, your market cap's about 30. Um, why don't we just give all the money back? And Martha and I looked at him aghast and we're like, no, the market's mispriced us. We're going to benefit yeah. from this change. And yeah. that's why. You've got to have that belief, haven't you? Yeah, exactly. But so talking about those poor companies that are not Guardian Media Group in that sense, mm -hmm. and you mentioned a, you know, it's not in the DNA of large organizations to sit down and try and work out how they cannibalize themselves and kill themselves. Mm -hmm. But what, how should large organizations you know, get into that sort of habit of innovation, if you like? Well, it's a mindset, and, and I think it's, it's, it's an attitude to risk-taking. Risk -taking. It's an attitude to failure, um, internal, mm. small failure, um, learning from your mistakes, all of those things. But it's mostly culture, and by that I really mean attracting the right talent. That, yeah. And I think many corporates that I've seen actually have too long a tenure of employees. I think that's one of the other issues is when you get to, I remember saying this to myself, it led to other people last minute to come. When I'm the guy in the meeting who kept saying, we tried this once and it didn't work, then I should go. Mm. You know, and I think that you see a lot happening in corporates because there is this long, almost corporate memory is too good, right? Because yeah, yeah. they do remember what they tried six years ago that like, didn't work. It's like, well, actually, the world's moved on since then. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think that's part of it. But we actually advise the corporates to have their own incubation labs. We're saying, yeah. yes, you should do. Innovation internally as well as externally with people like us. We're not quite the only people, but almost the only right. one. Um, <laughs> but you know, um, so so we we think those hybrid models work. But the other bit that we say, and this doesn't have to be done with us, mm. um, and this is um, where I think the synergy is is wonderful. Is corporates should work more with startups. Startups and corporates are a marriage made in heaven, actually, because corporates need that innovation and experimentation. And there are many different ways they can work with startups. And startups need the credibility and gravitas and the ability to scale that corporates can give. So the idea that startups are free R&D for corporates, I think is catching on more now, but I think it went through a sort of cold winter. Right. Um, but I think now we're seeing more of it, um, which is why, to be honest, for our consultancy business, Founders Intelligence, we often feel like we're pushing on an open door. I remember seeing a very big FTSE 100 company and the meeting was just, Perfect. The day before, they had had a board meeting saying we need to work more with startups, right. and then in comes us, and we're like, I'm like, I said to our CEO that, but I said, if we don't convert this one into a client, then we really are doing something wrong. Um, <laughs> let's let's add did. a few yeah. zeros yeah. on because yeah. we heard that what they said yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's brilliant. Um, because I, studying, uh, you know, back and last minute dot com, I, 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 I again watched an interview um, with you. I, I'm not a stalker. I'm just, I'm just doing my <laughs> good you, research you, on good you. Research. Don't, don't worry, don't worry, research. don't worry. Yeah. Um, is is when you were talking about um, how you tried voice recognition and it was it was a mm -hmm. bumpy road but it seems like you even back then were were as the CEO willing to allow things to happen that don't go as smoothly as you'd like in the name of testing yeah I mean I think it was partly to be honest I, I, I won't claim that clever I'll claim to love gadgets and love experimentation so yes it was so voice recognition to me was this dream back in 2000 2001 um, where you could talk to our database and I was like brilliant um, so we tried it, we played around, it was more of a marketing thing at the time, because yeah. it, didn't, it didn't, voice recognition just didn't work yeah. that well. But we did other things then, like we were, we had location-based deals on, discount deals on WAP phones, if people remember WAP phones. Yeah. Um, again, WAP was not ideally suited to this, yeah. but we did, but, and those business models sort of became Groupon and others. Yeah. So we also did Just Eat's business model before, before that existed. So we did restaurant yeah. food delivery back in 2001. Um, uh, but. So if yeah. anything, I'm disappointed by what's become of that last minute brand. I try not to be, you know, Martha and I try not to be like those two people in the back of the Muppets who used to criticize yeah. their past. Yeah. So, but it, it's disappointing to think that last minute .com only launched a mobile app, I think, last year. Yeah which is kind of tragic. So Howard Schultz went back and run Starbucks. We've got <laughs> Larry Page went back to Google. <laughs> if, if last minute, and you've got a lot of ideas for lastminute.com, so <laughs> would you ever, I mean, you, Presumably that would never be on the agenda. It, it's been, it, it was talked about a few years ago as it was sold, it was sold back recently. Um, people did approach me on it. Uh, 
Unfortunately, I think that the bit that needed to be done, which was the sort of spaghetti I helped create, which was we bought 10 businesses or 14 businesses, so there was multiple mm. back offices. There was all that complexity in the back end. wasn't fixed in 10 years since I right. sold it. Okay. If that had been fixed, it would have been more, more exciting because then you could move quickly. Yeah. Now I actually think there's an opportunity. I think a newer entrant could do what lastminute.com should do, which is everything at the last minute, which the mobile phone is the perfect device for. Yeah. Better dare I say it, than last mm. minute we'll be able to right. do because okay. I think they're going to be hamstrung yeah. by pace. Well, you must pace be out of your non-compete by now. You've got, yeah, you got yeah, founder's but no, factory. But, but looking forward now, I mean, I think very quickly after I saw yeah. it, I was so obsessed with okay. that, that that I wanted to just keep myself busy on everything else. Yeah. And it was sold. It was the past. Yeah. It was Absolutely. a reasonable ending. Um, Last question, if I can, um, Brent, because I know we're, we're, you, we've only got a certain amount of time with you. Um, Trends, um, talk about uh, cliches. You said this, I think, at one of the embassy meetings in Helsinki. You said, trends are your friends. And I don't know if that was after a few glasses of wine or not, but uh, it's a type of thing. Um, but, but you have, you know, you rode the internet trend very, very well. And part of innovation, as you know, is all about uh, putting some bets on where the yeah. future might be. But how can you keep a finger on the pulse, whether you're CEO of a FTSE 100 or a new startup entre entrepreneur trying to align your business with the future? How, how, do you, how can you have a finger on the pulse of what's coming up next? I think a finger in the pulse, a, a lot of it is about getting out there, right? I mean, I think too many, and again, I also think CEOs are getting better at this. I think it used to be that they were so rigid. I remember just, for example, trying to get a meeting with a CEO of an airline, and it was like six months. I don't think it was just me. Their diaries were so mm. so unspontaneous, even in the diary of planning, right? Mm. So I think it's about them being more spontaneous, getting out there, feeding off, sucking in, in, in insights from smart, younger people. So I think yeah. there's a lot about... Youth, although mm. I, I think we've passed the cliche, which is the, the sort of CEO saying we must do this because my teenager daughter yeah, does it. You know, right. um, so I hope we're getting more sophisticated than that. But I think lots of the trends are actually pretty. The broad trends are pretty obvious. Yeah. Um, whether it's artificial intelligence or big mm. data or Internet of Things or that health tech is going to be disrupted and ed tech is going to be disrupted and government as a service is going to be disrupted. You know, there are all these obvious, ob obvious sort of trends. But then it's how do you play into that that isn't quite as obvious and that's where you need to I think probably just put your smartest give your smartest people time to think about it mm. um, take some form of 20 percent time you know yeah. this this, yeah. The, the, this Google idea yeah. of um, which to me honest, I think many companies had before Google even we did this even last minute come I remember um, and in that case our obsession it wasn't as sophisticated as Google saying but my obsession was keeping prima donnas so I was like if there's a really difficult employee but he's a genius I would, and what he wanted, he'd come to me and say, I can't just work on solving someone else's bugs or doing this other thing. Mm. I want to work on really hard, difficult problems. And I was like, I'll give them a hard, difficult problem and let them work on something exciting for them just to keep them in the organization. Right. So I think that's another thing that, that corporates don't do. And, and those are the sort of ways mm. you, you, you keep attuned to the future. It's those, mm. out, I guess it's that, that, um, that Malcolm Gladwell book, Outliers, a bit, mm. right? You want to yeah. follow the outliers. It's even going back to one of my first internships at L'Oreal. And a lot of their th one of the theses of the L'Oreal founder was when you get that discordant anecdote from somewhere way out there, you pay attention to it. Right, absolutely, yeah. And it goes back to what you were saying right at the beginning about if you, if you hire uh, or you find yourself working with a prima donna that's hard to work with but a creative genius, a lot of people are not willing to work with those type of people because they find them pain in the ass. But great leaders do do that. I mean, they find a way to, to keep them, yeah, Absolutely because right. they're, they're, not, they're not scared of them. They yeah. know they can channel them in the right way. That's right. I hope I'm going to be, yeah. be more of a pain in the ass when I get back to work. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. Brent, thank you so much for your time right. today. I thank really you. appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you sir. Thank you. Thank you.